called into this case when a woman was found shot to death in a wooded area in Orlando. What was so unusual was that the killer did something to make sure that the body would be found. Later, two additional victims were found shot to death under similar circumstances, and we feared that he was a serial killer on the loose. We felt that he was dangerous, and we needed to stop him before he killed again. 10.15 a.m. On the outskirts of Orlando, Florida, Chris Petsich stumbles on a strange sight. I was down there walking my dog and over there I saw something that looked like a mannequin. But when his dog leads him closer, Chris realizes he's found something else entirely. When I came to see what it was, it wasn't a mannequin. Just past 10 a.m., the Orange County Sheriff's Office receives a call reporting the discovery of a woman's body. Deputy Joe Teporek responds to the scene. On the day the body was found, we were dispatched out after receiving a 911 hang-up from an individual said he found a body. There was a large pile of brush here. The body was on the other side of the pile of brush. Couldn't see it as you were coming up. She was uh, laying flat on her back in a provocative position, totally nude. There was no way to positively ID her at that time. She appeared to have been laying there for a while. Officers scour the area for clues and find something strange. Behind this tree over here, we found uh, her clothes, pot, neatly folded, shoes on top. And on the ground, you could see an outline of what appeared to be her body like she had been laying there for a while. This means someone had moved the body from the trees out onto the road. A bizarre and risky move. And when technicians arrive to examine the body, they find another puzzling clue. The only thing that was on her body at the time was a piece of wire wrapped around one of her ankles with a metal tag on it. When that tag was turned over, it had the first name of Patricia on it. The tag also has an address. Obviously, the killer wanted the victim to be identified. But why? 40-year-old Patricia Logan, a divorced mother of two, had fallen on hard times and recently turned to prostitution. But who would want her dead? As lead detective Angelo Chioda sets out to track Logan's last known movements, he knows he has more than one mystery to solve. Using the address that was on the tag we found on her body, we came to the boarding house here at South Washington Street, and she lived up on the second floor. We interviewed the witnesses there, and they confirmed by looking at her photograph that she had been staying there uh, with her boyfriend. But the boyfriend has an alibi, and no one else has seen Patricia Logan in days. Investigators decide to check out some of her favorite hangouts. Using the information from the witnesses, we found out she would frequent this area here. We came out with some flyers, put them up at the food mart, in the windows, and with anybody having information about Patricia Logan to please call Crime Line and help us out. The calls pour in but the tips lead nowhere. Based on the information we received, the last day that we could trace her to was four days before she was discovered murdered. We had no other information to indicate who the killer was. Stumped, detectives turn to the only concrete evidence they have, the crime scene itself. And when the medical examiner's report comes in, Kyoto notices something startling about when the victim's body had been moved. She had been dead probably four or five days, and she had been moved mo pretty recently, maybe within the night before. And what was unusual was that this person 
who killed her came back three or four days later and moves her back out to the roadway to be found. Why would the killer move the body and wait four days to do it? Detectives are baffled. It's time to call in a different kind of investigator. Profilers can be very helpful in cases where there isn't an eyewitness or where there isn't direct physical evidence that will link the offender to the crime. Because what we do is we read behavioral clues at the scene and we interpret those clues to tell the police what type of offender they should be looking for. Many of the killers that we've looked at over the years have made a lot of effort to try and hide the body and get rid of any physical evidence that even relates to the fact that a crime has occurred at all. What was so unusual about this investigation was that this killer moved the body to a place where she was certain to be discovered and with this type of looking for notoriety, we felt we probably had a serial murderer on our hands and he was going to do this again. When Patricia Logan is found shot to death in the middle of a dirt road, her homicide leaves more questions than answers. Investigators hope FBI-trained criminal profiler Dale Hinman can help shed some light on the investigation's biggest mystery. Detective Kyoto wants Agent Hinman's perspective on why the killer moved the body. From back from the lab. Hey, this is the dirt road off of West Colonial. Here's where the body is found. Her clothing is west of her and south of her, little bits of ways in the woods. And it, from the medical examination, appears that she had been laying there at least probably three days before she was moved from this tree line back out to the roadway. That's really unusual because it would seem like most of the people who you know, would kill somebody in an area like this would want them to not be discovered. A killer who doesn't fit the usual patterns. Agent Hinman has seen this kind of behavior before. There's two possible reasons for this. One is the person felt compassion for her and wanted to move her out into the roadway so she would be discovered and then, in fact, put her name and address available to make sure that he had her correctly identified. Or it could have been that he didn't feel like he had any attention from the media and by making sure that she was discovered, he could then claim credit for this crime. And a killer who craves the attention is a killer who'll strike again. One month later, a woman walking her dog in a wooded area not far from the first crime scene makes a shocking discovery. 22-year-old Mary Ann Vopel and 28-year-old Stephanie Singleton are both found shot to death and posed in the woods. Like the first victim, the women both work as prostitutes, and the scenario is eerily familiar. Special Agent Hinman and Orlando Police Detective Glenn Gauz head to the scene. They want to find out if it's the work of the same person who killed Patricia Logan. Dale, over here is where we found both bodies. One was partially nude, and the other was totally nude. This is very similar to the Patricia Logan homicide scene because you have essentially um, the bodies here and a roadway and also a body of water. The terrain is nearly identical, but there's one major difference from the first murder. Whoever killed these women did not move their bodies afterwards. How long were the victims' bodies here before they were discovered? One had been killed probably about 48 hours prior to us finding the second one, 24 hours or less. To Hinman, it makes perfect sense. The killer didn't move the bodies because he didn't have to. I think it's significant that he's placing these bodies in areas that are well-traveled where they're likely to be found. And I wonder what he would have done if the bodies hadn't been discovered quickly by transients or campers who were in the area. He might have come back and moved these the same way Patricia Logan's body was moved. Hinman is certain the same killer is responsible for all three homicides. She's also convinced he'll kill again. Investigators redouble their efforts, and the work begins to pay off. One of the people that we did contact, it was close to uh, Singleton, Stephanie Singleton, was a, a guy named Larry Powell. 
Larry Powell is the third victim's live-in boyfriend. He has no alibi, and she was last seen heading towards home. Investigators ask Powell if he'll submit to a new kind of lie detector test, and he says yes. Detective Keith Dudley is a voice stress examiner. This is the type of test that was used on Larry Powell. It's a voice stress analyzer, similar to a lie detector, but we hook this microphone up to the subject, and the computer was able to read any stress in their voice and changes the normal pattern. The detective asks Powell a series of questions about his relationship with the victim. The machine reads the stress in his voice as he answers. The human voice has AM and FM frequencies in a normal voice, and basically during stressful times, according to the amount of stress, then the FM disappears. If Larry Powell is lying about his involvement in the murders, the machine will likely detect it. Larry Powell was asked, did he kill Stephanie Singleton, or did he know who killed Stephanie Singleton? Coming up next, Larry Powell's response. Is he the serial killer they're searching for? Profiler Dale Hinman has determined that two murder scenes in the Orlando area are the work of a serial killer. Detectives hope a voice stress analysis will reveal if the boyfriend of the third victim is the man they're searching for. They begin the interview of Larry Powell. See, this one asks his, his name, and there's no deception in it. This one started to block off because we asked him a question and asked him a lie on, and it started to block. It went from the AM and FM in this one, frequencies in this one, to just the AM in this one. With the standard established, it's time for the critical questions. Larry Powell was asked, did he kill Stephanie Singleton, or did he know who killed Stephanie Singleton? And his responses were no, and there was no deception shown on his charts. According to the machine, Larry Powell is telling the truth. He drops to the bottom of the suspect list. Investigators turn once again to criminal profiler Dale Hinman. Many people see violent crime as being on a continuum, that once a person starts committing crimes, they commit the same crime over and over, but they get worse each time, when in fact that sometimes is not true. So in this investigation, we thought it might be important to look at victims that may have survived being attacked under similar circumstances. Hinman advises investigators to look for other prostitutes who have been shot recently. Maybe they can find a connection. The strategy works. 29-year-old Yolanda Niels had been shot in the face just four days before the first victim was found. She was standing just off the street in a wooded lot when an unknown man attacked her. I looked to the right because a car was coming up the road. And before I turned to look back, wow, he shot me. When I fell to the ground, I stumbled and I ran and I fell, pow, he shot at me. I ran and I fell, pow, he shot at me. It was my last fall when I got up, click, click, no more bullets in the gun. Yolanda stumbles into the street where a passerby calls for help. I was sitting in the middle of the road and I had said, Lord, I know I'm wrong for what I'm doing, but please, if I live, let me see, remember who this guy is so I can get him for what he done to me. Please don't let me forget. Is it possible the man who shot Yolanda Niels is the serial killer investigators are searching for? There's only one way to find out. Agent Hinman and homicide detectives Angelo Chioda and Glenn Gauze head to the crime scene. This is where Yolanda Niels was shot. She was shot in the woods over here, ran down Wallace to Turkey Lake, and at the intersection, she collapsed and the ambulance was called. Let's look at where these are on this map. So the first crime that we have reported to us is Patricia Logan, and the next one that we consider is Singleton and Vopel, and so now this recent crime is Miss Neal's at this location. What we're looking at here is really essentially a, a relatively small triangle of events. 
It's over here in the woods. So far, like the similarities between the three scenes are striking, but Hinman wants to be sure. All right. Okay, right over here is where she was shot. She got shot in the face, fell down, and then ran up to the roadway. You know what strikes me about these three different scenes is they're basically all the same. You have a body of water right here, a bunch of trees around it, and a very major roadway right in the vicinity of all three of these crimes. Actually, if we had all these crime scene pictures out of this notebook and if someone was to stumble and drop them on the ground, I think it's unlikely we'd be able to put them all back at the, in the actual crime scene order because you're essentially at the same crime scene over and over again. You're right. Agent Hinman has seen everything she needs to. She's convinced the three crimes are all related. The man who shot Yolanda Niels is the serial killer they're looking for. And with a surviving victim to interview, the killer may soon have a face. We're not interested in the hair or the age or anything like that, just the overall shape. Composite artist Steve Fusco asks Yolanda to pick out her attacker's features one by one. Okay, you said he was about 40 years old. Yes. Okay, so we're gonna give him some, some lines. Sculpting Feature out. by feature, the killer's face emerges. How close is this on a one to 10 scale? It's a nine. I look exactly like him. Finally, Orlando serial killer has a face. Now, they just have to find him. Coming up next, investigators discover another victim. Will this case provide the final clue to the serial killer's identity? Surviving victim Yolanda Niels has provided police with a composite sketch of the serial killer they're looking for. Now, it's time to enlist the public's help. We all felt it was so important to release the composite sketch to the media because we felt that this individual had ties to this community and that he remained in the Orlando area. And the more people that saw the composite, the better, because certainly somebody was going to recognize him and call in a tip. The tactic works. Police get a call from a woman named Tracy Adams who says she was also shot by the man in the composite drawing. One month earlier, Tracy was standing on the side of the road when a man drove up and shot her in the arm. Tracy survived the attack, but couldn't identify the shooter until the police sketch jogged her memory. And Tracy has a piece of information that could break the case wide open. Tracy then at one point there was with her husband and her daughter at a uh, meat market when she saw the person that shot her and recognized the car and she got the tag number. Police trace the license plate to a man named Frederick Cox. Detectives create a photo lineup and show it to the surviving victims. Both identify Cox without hesitation. Officers can now obtain a search warrant for Cox's car. And finally, they discover the proof they've been waiting for. A 9 millimeter handgun is in the glove box. The lab matched Frederick Cox's gun to the casings that were recovered where Tracy Adams and Yolanda Niels were shot. They were also able to match the projectiles that were recovered from Singleton and Vopel to Frederick Cox's gun. And that's not all. The ballistics database also matches Cox's gun to two additional unsolved cases where women were shot and survive. But there is still no evidence tying Cox to the first homicide, Patricia Logan. Frustrated, detectives turn once again to Cox's car. I was kind of exasperated because I had no information. I couldn't visually see anything that I could quickly identify in the vehicle. I just stood by and watched this sharing process. And I was explaining to her, so just anything, give me a call right away. And she looks down at the area between the seat and the side and says, oh, like these pieces of paper here? And she pulled up and flipped over, and she flipped over the other half of the tag that was tied to Patricia Logan. I almost fell out. And I did. I went screaming out the door, Stu, Stu Glenn, and went running out after you. You won't believe what we just found. 
This final piece of evidence allows prosecutors to charge Frederick Cox with all three murders. In an emotional trial, Cox is convicted of multiple counts of first-degree murder and attempted murder. He is sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In just 45 days, Frederick Cox shot seven women. Three of the women died, and four of the women will have to live with that experience for the rest of their lives. We may never know how many other women he may have victimized in the past, but we do know that he'll never hurt anyone else again. On the day the body was found, we were dispatched out after receiving the 911 hang up from an individual said he found a body. There was a large pile of brush here. The body was on the other side of the pile of brush. She couldn't see it as you were coming up. She was uh, laying flat on her back in a provocative position, totally nude. case when a woman was found shot to death in a wooded area in Orlando. What was so unusual was that the killer did something to make sure that the body would be found. One month later, two additional victims were found shot to death under similar circumstances, and we feared that he was a serial killer on the loose. felt that he was dangerous and we needed to stop him before he killed again. 10.15 a.m. On the outskirts of Orlando, Florida, Chris Petsich stumbles on a strange sight. I was down there walking my dog and over there I saw something that looked like a mannequin. But when his dog leads him closer, Chris realizes he's found something else entirely. When I came to see what it was, it wasn't a mannequin. Just past 10 a.m., the Orange County Sheriff's Office receives a call reporting the discovery of a woman's body. Deputy Joe Taporek responds to the scene. 